All right, Sagar, what's on your radar? Well, we've covered here since the beginning of the show the seeming inability of populists on the left and the right to effectively lobby power in their own parties to get what they want. Politico had a new story out yesterday detailing exactly this phenomenon on the left in Congress. The story describes in detail how AOC, members of the squad, squad and Congressional Progressive Caucus continue to work hand in glove with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to shape major bills. The story says that Pelosi has told some within the party that some of their priorities may be featured in the next relief package. But it even features quotes from their own Progressive Caucus members in the story saying that it may not be time to take a stand against Pelosi on this round because maybe they'll get what they want next time. And I wish I could tell you the situation wasn't as bleak on the light on the right, but I would be lying. Senator Mitch McConnell has shot down President Trump's proposed infrastructure plan. The Republican leadership has been talking about national debt for a few days. And Senator Ted Cruz wrote an op-ed that very much illustrates the thoughts of the mainstream GOP yesterday, saying, quote, we need to push pause on spending and not allow Nancy Pelosi to hijack discussions on the path forward. Senators Rubio, Hawley, Cotton, and others, they've been more effective at getting scraps of what they want into bills, but that isn't exactly a cause for celebration. So the question is, what do we do about it? It's a question I get from so many of you every day. Is a populist left-right alliance possible? Teamwork in class, can we do it? It's within the realm of political imagination, especially in a time like this, when establishment Democrats and Republicans are both sticking completely to their priority line. So my friend Emily Jashinsky, she asked me this in a recent interview I gave, and I answered honestly. I said that if you'd asked me before the crisis, I might have said yes, but ultimately that I'm pretty much have concluded that there are so many bad faith actors on the left that will denounce anyone within their own side who tries to work with the other side as Nazi collaborators that it's probably not worth it. And that, by the way, was written before the woke left tried to cancel Crystal for admitting that Tucker Carlson had a point. So also interviewed in that article was friend of the show, Matt Stoller. He described what a possible left-right populist alliance might look like. And just as I predicted in the piece, he was denounced as a Nazi enabler by everyone from Jacobin to woke Twitter at the New York Times. So that pretty much sets the stage for where we are right now. The populist left is irrelevant in policymaking and seems to care more about Instagram live concurrence than they do actually making legislation. And I can't imagine who I'm talking about there. The populist right comes up with great ideas, just hasn't found a way to vanquish Dorner orthodoxy in their own party. So the path forward is kind of simple, and it's what I predicted in that Federalist interview. It's up to the right and to the left to fight as hard as they possibly can within their own party. The leadership is never going to give it to you. You have to take it. And there is so much distrust on both sides to do really anything. Crystal and I are far more the exceptions than the rules. And it means that both sides have to take it upon themselves to vanquish the powerful moneyed forces that keep them at bay. Because establishments of both parties claim to hate each other, but they actually agree on a lot. And it's time to turn that hatred around and win internal battles and be willing to be hated by your own party. Because it's got to be war. The stakes are just too high. The battle is literally existential for millions in America. And it's amazing, Crystal, you know, the reaction to that interview. You would think it's like I suggested. I mean, you would think that anybody on the left who's uh, considering working with anyone on the right is literally a Nazi enabler. I mean, I saw Jamel Bowie, your friend over at the New York Times, um, <laughs> explicitly <laughs> tweeting about this being like the virulent racism and white nationalism they just want us to ignore. And it's just like the reaction to this explicitly demonstrates what I was talking about in the piece. And it's just by, by, by keeping everybody apart. By the way, look. People on the right are not good faith actors either, okay? Nobody, there's not a good faith army willing to be embraced. There's a lot of people out there who are never going to trust anybody who ever voted for Bernie Sanders. And so the real question is, it's like, what do we do? Right. And I think that the only, the only response is something that you have been only courageous and willing to do from the left, which is to challenge the nominee of your own party and orthodoxy and be willing to say, no, maybe not this time. And that's, um, there's not enough people on the right who are willing to do that either. And I'm just realizing there's no like mystical force that's just gonna like wave you up to power. That's just not how it happens. The truth is 2016 in the election that Trump went out and destroyed his own party apparatus. And look, yeah, he was eventually swallowed back up by them because they're much more powerful <laughs> Powerful. They're very they persistent. Seem, they're very, very. When this money, that amount of money is on the line, they're very persistent people. But I've just been thinking a lot about this question, and I just, I don't really know what the well, answer because is. Because I mean, I'm glad you did this because, yeah. in some ways, it's like the central project of this show mm -hmm. is, um, and this was what I said, you know, to Ben Smith at the New York Times is like 
to hate each other less yeah. and the people in this town the, more, more, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, Kyle Kalinske actually did a good reaction video to that whole stupid thing with Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys saw this whole thing where I granted him, like, credit yeah. while actually calling him a xenophobe <laughs> for, because he criticized Trump, something that, you know, the left claims to care yeah. about Republicans doing. Anyway, so people freaked out. Oh, you're just hand-waving away racism. How can you say anything good about this person, which is ridiculous. So Kyle made this point of, you know, there's a lot of fixation on the left about, oh, you're creating a bridge to the alt-right yes. or to white nationalism. But there's never any focus on you're creating a bridge back from that, from right. de-radicalization. Because what radicalizes people? What radicalizes people is when they feel that the stakes are existential, when they feel that if you're on the left, that Everyone on the right is evil and bad, and they must be resisted at all costs in all ways, and to do anything less is enabling the worst elements of society. Right. And if you're on the right, to agree with the left or grant or be nice to them or like have any friendly thoughts about them means like communism in Venezuela or whatever the particular you know horror stories yep. that you all tell over there, right? And so what you end up doing, and this is, this is like coming right down from the, that's exactly what they want, because that ends up with the working class divided between the two parties and in exactly the situation that we find ourselves in today, with a few actors on the right who have some decent ideas in terms of and economics. And are trying, but they don't have what it takes. And they are, just can't do and it. And are trying. There's only a few of yeah. them. They're not willing to be hated by their own party and be ostracized. Yeah. On the left, there was a, uh, another interview with AOC in the New York Times, and it was sort of heartbreaking. I mean, she was the only Democrat who voted against this last pathetic relief bill. And she was the only one. Right. And she talked about being heartbroken because she had colleagues that had sort of signaled to her that they were likely no votes, and it was only right before that she realized she would be the only one. And that is a brutally hard road to walk. So that's what you end up with is this, you know, complete division, complete mistrust between, you know, the different faction of the working class and with corporatists who, you know, they may throw rhetorical bombs at each other, but at the end of the day, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell are perfectly happy to work together to give $4 trillion to big business. Yeah, and that's, that's where we are. That's the truth. They don't actually hate each other all that much. They only pretend to. And the stuff they do hate each other about is like process crimes. Like, oh, you held up this vote on whatever. Let's like, they don't actually hate each other for the right reasons. And I just, you know, look, voters, this is the other thing. Voters don't think this way, but changing parties is actually an elite game. You actually have to win amongst the elites in order to make sure you can use it using voter power. But ultimately, certain people have to work in the administration. Those people are always going to be of a certain pedigree. And so I have just looked at this and I'm like, I, I truly, this is sad because I can see what's happening in this next round of negotiations, mm -hmm. which is that somehow, you know, Art Laffer and Steve Moore are out there pushing the idea of a payroll tax cut which is now the new red line for the Trump administration. God. Now we're going to have a modest infrastructure bill. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are going to want like a 12th hospital bailout to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars or COBRA subsidies, which isn't even another giveaway right, to, give the, away insurance to the insurance industry. companies. So you're like, okay, so you got one side fighting for the insurance industry. You have another side, which is willing to gamble with small business loans um, for some fake ideas about the national debt and about deficit spending that don't actually, they adhere to whenever it comes to the military budget. So you're right. like, well, what is what is all this about? Like, what 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 is the what is the point of all this thing? And then at the same time, you have on the left, you got Joe Biden um, who's sitting there. On the right, I mean, if Trump wins re-election, Mitch McConnell's still going to be the Senate Majority Leader. Mm -hmm. It's still going to run the show. And so you're, the the only question, the only conclusion I have is like, you pretty much just have to go to war with orthodoxy in your own party. And look, I mean, Sanders' campaign, what we talked about here, the reason he lost, in our view, was because he wasn't willing to do that. Right. And people need to learn that lesson, not that he was, oh, he was too out there and all that. No, 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 no. He did not go to war with, I mean, he had a few tweets where he's like, I have a news for the Democratic establishment. I'm coming for you or something like that. People freaked out just at that one. They hated him. No matter how many times he endorsed Biden, no matter how many times he said his friend, Biden's not corrupt. Now he's raising money for the DNC. And I'm like, look, it's because of that behavior, as you said, they can kick you in the teeth and walk away and say, what are you going to do? Are you going to go vote for the other guy? Well, and that is, I think, yeah. why he did so much more poorly this time around with white working class voters and with rural voters, more conservative voters in the Democratic Party. In 2016, he really was kicking the Democratic Party. Yes. They were like, what are you 
do it. Like, yeah, you, you, so you, right. They, yeah. And he was a total independent. Yeah. Between 2016 and 2020, you know, they brought him into Senate leadership yeah. from the beginning. He's taken the right. unity pledge, all of that. So he became a sort of more conventional party player within the Democratic Party. And that was the appeal that he held to white working class and more conservative rural voters who felt disenfranchised from the Democratic Party. And they're like, oh, this guy is like us because he is also disgusted with the Democratic Party and willing to kick them in the teeth and, and want something different and something new. I think that that is a really undersold part. It's, it is that thing of, I mean, that's what it comes down to. It is hard to be hated. It's like goes against everything in your human nature. I mean, yes. This is like a very deep, visceral thing, which is why reading that article about AOC, I really felt for and I feel for you know I feel for folks on the right too who are trying to step out and be courageous and offer smacked. a different yeah. it's, it is they call a them right wing socialists right? <laughs> it's a hard thing to be hated but that's exactly what you have to be willing to do in order to show a different path and here's the thing people in this town will hate you but people will love you yeah real people will love you and that's what people always need to remember is that you know this small segment of the elite they may, they run everything here and very but, over represented on Twitter too oh by the way oh god yeah <laughs> Twitter is not real life if it was I would be dead but uh, I mean it's just one of these things where you can see over and over again and I just want to emphasize the point of this is for both sides because look whoever wins good luck to you because I think that that is really what it's going to take and as I've said here before building up good elements of the left and right makes a good competition. If people are fighting over who is better for workers and policy, yeah. we live in a better country. We just totally, do. Totally true. Right. Next on Rising, The Intercept's DC bureau chief in front of the show, Ryan Grimm, continues facing some backlash for daring to report on Tara <laughs> Reid's allegations. He shares his response when Rising returns. <laughs> 